out in the beautiful Wisconsin farmlands east of where the Mississippi meets the St. Croix. Randy Johnson and Jan Makichi Johnson have been producing pottery in their River Falls workshop for over 30 years. They carry on a strong lineage and influence from Shoji Hamada, Juan McKenzie, and Bernard Leach. In the mid-70s, Randy lived in Japan and worked at the pottery of Tatsuzo Shimoka. Randy is a professor at the University of Wisconsin River Falls, and he and Jan have led numerous workshops around the United States. Their work is in many international public and private collections. And Randy has work in the permanent collections of the Minneapolis Art Institute, Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and the Los Angeles County Museum. Our conversation started off talking about how the Japanese reverence for artistic tradition contrasts greatly with the experimentation American artists often pursue. thinking actually about how for many years in my life I felt that what was lacking, the biggest thing lacking, was tradition. And so the first time we went to Japan I was so excited about, um, the prime example was going to the No Theater and being told that these are the children of a living national treasure that are carrying on and I went back to the house that we were staying at, and it was an American woman married to a Japanese man, and I just said, oh, Amy, I'm so just awestruck by this lineage and this carrying on this tradition, and those were his children, and, and she just looked at me and she said, and do you expect your sons to be potters? And it was just like somebody hitting me over the head with a board, you know, it's like, Oh, you know, they, they don't, realizing they don't have a choice to move outside of this, that yeah. this is the expectation. Right. And then feeling grateful again coming back to the yeah. States, which when we travel, I very often come home with this embracing of all the freedom we have and all the space that we have. And we have a different freedom than say a Japanese culture, if you're the 14th generation potter of a family, you have an expectation to continue that line. But here, I mean, we're first generation people, but we're influenced by some very important people like Warren McKenzie and Shoji Hamada and Tatsuzo Shimoka. But we're also influenced by many cultures of uh, and artists working that don't have names anymore from early Greek cultures and early Chinese cultures and early uh, like Iranian cultures, things like that. But we have the freedom to choose and look at the aesthetics of those different cultures and groups yeah. and we can, we can pick and, and choose kind of influences. without having permission to go to interject your own spirit into the work if you're, you know, having these strict parameters. How can that piece have any mm -hmm. vitality if it's not something that has something of the creator that's unique? Yeah. Yeah, the voice. The voice, yeah. Yeah. It's all really a dialogue when you're creating these pieces. Right. That's so true. You get in the studio and you begin working and then uh, time sort of disappears. I mean, time for me, when I'm out here, this is my time. This is the gift that I've given myself in life, I think. And that just, time goes so quickly when you're out here. You just, 
you, you forget that it's time to eat or you forget that it's time to go to bed or you forget that it's the weekend. Some people say, oh, how do you come home from teaching all day at the university and go out in your studio? Well, how do you not? You know, how do you not go out there? Mm -hmm. When the studio beckons like that, you have the chance to disappear into this timeless, you're just a vehicle almost with little conscious thought, just getting things going. And I've always, I've always had the attitude that um, that begins to happen just by working. You know, people say, well, where, where do your ideas come from? Don't you ever reach plateaus? Things like that. And if you're playful, if you're observant, if you give yourself the permission that Jane's talking about, you can see, you know, you'll see ideas happen on a piece that you hadn't predisposed or you hadn't thought that were going to happen. Mm -hmm. And if you give yourself a permission to react to those, it will generate new pieces, and that keeps going. Of course, the thing to do is, okay, when, when do you pull the reins in on the horse and slow down a little bit? Or you just, you know, some people can stumble into this chaos, and there's nothing positive that maybe comes out of it. Mm -hmm. You maybe you think you're generating something significant, but you really aren't. Does that makes no, sense. No, I totally agree that the only way to, to get there is through the actual uh, working process because I used to try to um, say, well, until I really have this idea figured out, I guess I'll just wait. You know, but, re but really it only happens through making that you're going to resolve yeah. anything. With I'm putting up next to my desk uh, more than once, just do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> more complex. Put, you, chest. put yourself in motion. Hold the chair out, sit down in it, and put your back in. Right. <laughs> Randy and Jan, remarkably enough, have two major kilns on their property. They're both a type of oriental climbing kiln, or dragon's back kiln. Built on a slope and fired over a few days with a large supply of wood. Pottery fired with wood has a distinctive look because of the ash. The main kiln that they use is a Naborigama design, which has separate chambers. But a few years back, with students from the University of Wisconsin, they built a second Anigama kiln, which has just one large chamber. This is a more primitive style kiln, it's like an 8th century AD style kiln. We've been running about 1,100 to 1,230 pieces. It's a lot of work. It takes, it, we fire it for five days. It takes about three or four days to load. Mm -hmm. It takes about a uh, day to unload. Most of the ones in Japan load from the front. I had loaded a few of those and I decided I was getting way too old for it. Duck walking in with pots and duck yeah. walking back out. I decided to put a side door in this one. Uh -huh. for it. We load the, the back and then we load the front and then we load this middle part and kind of walk out towards it. What's difficult for me at this point, after having committed 30 years of my life to this endeavor, is that people do, um, I think, not understand how much work it is. Even though it's doing something that you really love, it's an incredible investment of physical energy to work with clay. I think about that quite often lately. Like, they look at a, a piece of pottery and think, well, you know, are you really charging $30 for that? And with no comprehension of how much work it is, you know, mm -hmm. but yeah. primarily uh, I'm grateful to be doing something that I love doing, whatever the compensation is for that. Mm -hmm. But then, don't you have those who, who come along who say that 
that $30 is too little, right? Well, that's the East and West Coast. <laughs> but we live in the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell my students who are thinking about going into the arts that if they mm -hmm. choose to do that, I, I really don't know they have a choice, you know, to be honest. I think that it's, art is so compelling that's something you have to do. And that you just find other ways to support that habit. But being an artist, it's, it's, um, it's a much more elusive thing. You not only have to create the product, but you have to find vehicles and ways of marketing the product and selling mm -hmm. yeah. uh, your art. And very often, I think if you're truly involved and good at what you're doing, it's not always acceptable by society as, um, you know, why are you making that? You know, why don't you make something pretty? Why don't you make something that has blue on it? Or, you know, things like that, mm -hmm. the, the questions that come up. And so what we do isn't always palatable. If you're, you know, you're really pushing the edge of your material and your process, I think you're sometimes outside of people's general understanding of where ceramics or where art should be in their minds. And here, but there's a, there's a evolution of the idea over time. You know, in, in art, making a drawing, making an object, you're you're really expressing a moment of time in your life as a creative person, mm -hmm. and you're expressing an idea within that moment. And it's not always right, but it's, it's something I think you're compelled to do. I used to joke, um, I worked in Japan. In Japan, if you said you were a potter or worked in ceramics, people would typically bow and call you sensei. Mm -hmm. and, be very respectful and in the United States, so it, less less so now than in the past. But you know, you're sitting next to somebody in a plane and you tell them you're a potter, they say, "Oh, I'm sorry." And move to the next <laughs> That's seat. the end of the conversation. <laughs> you know, oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs>
Not quite big enough. And the other one is slightly larger. Mm. UPS wouldn't take it, nobody would take oh, it. The shipping was 600 something. <laughs> <laughs> I should go in the shipping business. <laughs> <laughs>